Hello, good morning. Good morning. How are we? Good. We're in a series called Let Us Worship. It's on worship. And last week, we defined worship as living all of life to the glory of God. Every aspect of our life is to be lived to the glory of God. And we emphasize it's about lifestyle, not just coming to church and doing the 11 to 1130 thing. But it's every moment of your life. It's when you're standing in line at Safeway, Target, Walmart. It's when you're in the gas station. That's all a part of worship. When you are driving down the 101, it is worship. When you're disciplining your kids, it's an act of worship. Everything we do is an act of worship. And so we ended off last week um, kind of on a weird note talking about the fact that kids, when I asked them about worship and when we get to the slow songs, why do they sit down and kind of not participate? And they said, because it's boring. And I said, okay. Well, if you think it's boring, why do you think it's boring? And they gave some answers. But I think really what they said is what a lot of other people believe, that when we get to the slower songs, it's boring. Or I don't really know what to do with my body when we're in worship. Like, I know it's worship, but what, what am I supposed to do? Because a lot of people are new to church. They haven't been in church their whole life. Or they've seen stuff and they don't know, why are we doing that particular movement? Why are we acting that way? They don't know. So today, I want us to look at um, this idea of use your body. Use your body. So turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to start there. We're not really going to be there too long, but Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And you know this passage. Paul, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you got it, say, aye. aye. Yeah. I got a new one every week. Here we go. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your what? Bodies. God gave you a body. And he wants us to use it as we worship him. Um, in the church, there's this debate that goes on among Christians and a lot of worship leaders also as to when we are in church, how much physical expression is sufficient. When, when we're in worship, how much is enough? When we're, when we're standing here in worship, how much can I do? How much am I required to do? Because some people would say that we are reserved. Some churches are unemotional. Some churches are conservative. And so they, when they say, when we get into worship, we don't do any of that. And so there's this debate. Worship leaders and pastors, they go to conferences and they get together and they say, when we get together in worship, what kinds of things do we have to do when we're in worship? Now, we're going to look at that today. But I want us to have this principle throughout the entire message. And the principle is this, that our bodies naturally respond to what affect our soul. Our bodies naturally respond to what affects our souls. Naturally. Now you got to think about this in your own life. Those of you guys who have kids, if your kid runs up to you and says, Mommy or Daddy, what do you do? <gasps> hey, your body responds. Your eyes light up, your hands go out, you bend down because they're your child and you love them. They affect your soul. Um, when you guys have a plate of food and you stacked it up real nice, you got everything on there, and somebody almost knocks it over. Hey, dude, watch out. Why? Because that food, I want that food. It affects me. So my body responds to it. When you guys are in, when somebody's child dies, you cry. When you're at a sports event and your team scores a touchdown, you celebrate, you put your hands up, you scream, you dance, you do all that stuff. Whatever affects your soul, when your body, I'm sorry, our bodies naturally respond to whatever affects our soul. So that it's, it's a fact. There is no getting around the fact because you say, well, I'm just reserved. Well, if you are the kind of person that things affect you, then your body will respond. 
It's natural. When my dad went to Africa, I forgot how old I was. I remember we were waiting in the office. Me and my mom were waiting for him. And he was coming back, and I hadn't seen him in I don't know how long. And he walked through the door, and I cried. I said, Daddy! Why? Because I loved my dad. And I hadn't seen him in how long? I don't, I don't remember what was going on there, me and my mom. Six weeks, he was gone. And I saw him, I cried. Because my dad was the one that I loved. And so when we're in service, we're in church, our bodies should naturally respond to the things that we're hearing and to the things that we're seeing. Now, again, this happens naturally, but I can already hear in some people's minds, because I don't read minds, but I've just been in church long enough to know <laughs> what people are thinking. Because um, people will say, wait a minute, what about the heart? Isn't God more concerned about our hearts? Doesn't he say that? For example, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, listen to what he says here. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the what? Outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So some say, hey, all God cares about is my heart. That's what he cares about. See, because Jesus said that some people worship him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. So people say, hey, there are some people who are in church lifting their hands and they got a wicked heart. God would care more that I have a pure heart than about me lifting my hands. Now, my thing is, we should just do both. We should have a pure heart and lift our hands. But people say, it's just about the heart. So I really don't have to do all the physical stuff because God's looking at outward appearance. The worship leader and the pastor, they're all looking at what I'm doing with my body, but God's looking at my heart. That's one of the things, they'll, they'll respond to it that way. Or some people would say, see, when we're in church, it's a time for reverence and it's a time for awe. It's God. He's in heaven. We are on earth. We should not be flailing around. We should not be doing... Well, listen to what Hebrew says. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. is what they would say. Therefore, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So there are people who would say all that physical stuff is not, is not needed because we should be in awe of God. Doing all that dancing and laying and clapping and raising and shouting, all of that is not in awe of God. That is chaotic. And they would use this scripture and say, no, that God's looking at the heart. He's not looking at outward. And when we're in church, we should be reverent. We should be quiet. The instruments should not be that loud. We should sing song. We should stand straight. This is all. When somebody walks into a room who has dignity, you don't jump around and dance and flail. You honor them. You are quiet. You look at them. You say, that is a person of dignity, and you don't move. I don't believe this, by the way. So you're like, ah! <laughs> this is what people believe. Now, here's the problem. That oftentimes we get very unbalanced in the way we view Christianity. We'll go to one extreme or the other. Does God look at the heart? Absolutely, yes. Does God care about what's going on the inside rather than what's going on the outside? Absolutely. But the scriptures are filled with exhortations for us to use our bodies in worship. All that physical stuff, they would say, that just dishonors God. It just dishonors him because it's not really love. It's more emotionalism. You ever been to a church where you feel like people are like doing a show more than they are worshiping God? They say, hey, this is, this, is, this is not worship. This is you trying to impress me. Or this is you just doing church the way we're supposed to do church. When we come to church, we're supposed to say amen. We're supposed to run around. We're supposed to dance. We're supposed to get happy. And they say it's emotionalism. I would agree. Oh, absolutely. I've been in church all my life, and I've seen it. Even in our own church, I'm wondering, now this person I know is not walking with the Lord. You're the most emotional person in here. 
Why, why are you so happy? You're just going to go out and do the very things the pastor said don't do when you get outside. Because it's not connected to the heart. Their worship is just words, it's just lips, but it's not connected to the heart. So they would say those things dishonor God. But what I would say to us is that there should be a balance and that all throughout the scripture, he does call us to use our bodies in worship of him. Yes, sometimes we are in awe. Sometimes we need to be quiet. Sometimes we need to not be moving around. But there are times where we do need to use our bodies. And we're going to get into that a little bit today. How do we use our bodies in worship? But before we get into that, I want to talk about some hindrances to using our bodies. What are some of the hindrances? Because I know when we come into a church, some of us have some things that will keep us from expressing ourselves. So three things. Number one, the fear of man. Some people, when they come to church, they don't want to use their body in worship because they're afraid of what somebody's going to say about them. What are you doing all that clapping for? What are you dancing about? And people are worried about that, and so because of that, they don't sing. They don't dance. They don't clap. They just stand there because they're afraid of man. Listen to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. This is what he says. The fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear God, don't fear men. What can man do to you? Laugh at you? Oh, no. They laughed at me. My life is over now. If Jesus, if Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me in front of men, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my father and the holy angel. You imagine coming up to Jesus at the judgment of Jesus. He's like, oh, no. Oh, I don't know him, Lord. I don't know. What a, what, you ever been like you walk somewhere and somebody that you knew, knew you, acted like they didn't know you? Someone said all the time. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, some people are ashamed of Jesus. When I, I still struggle with this now. Sometimes I'm riding in my car and I'm listening to music and the windows are down. And it's like the, the most like rowdy song about Jesus. Jesus is Lord. You're going to hell. Like stuff like that. And I like roll down and the person's there and it's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and so I'll roll up the window. It's like, I don't want to be bothered. Not like they're going to follow me or they're going to like talk to me or like come around and like, I heard your music. And I'm like, no. They're not going to do it. But I was just so just ashamed. I'll be honest with you. I was ashamed and I would write up my music. Especially if I was listening to like not rap. I was listening to like worship music. I was like black dude in there listening to like, God, you're worthy. And I'm just like, oh, God. So I was just very, I, I just, I was ashamed. But this broke for me when I was in college in Sacramento State. There was this dude named Corey. And we lived on the dorms and he was staying in the dorm far down the 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 way from me. And so one day I come up from class and I hear this gospel music. Not rap. I'm like gospel music. Like Hezekiah or choir. <laughs> right? It's like, I'm thinking, who in the world is listening to gospel music in here? <laughs> so I got curious. I went around the inn. And you guys know what I'm saying? My friend Corey was this black dude. He's very, very popular. Just good with the girls. Everything. Just not- cool dude. So I come around the corner, and there's Corey sitting in his, in his dorm. The door is wide open. He's sitting there with a boombox blasting his music. And I said, wow, Lord, that, that emboldened me. I was like, okay, from now on, I'm not even going to be afraid to listen to my music. I don't even listen to that. I listen to rap. And listen to rap, more people are going to probably like that more than the gospel music. But I saw this guy being bold. He was unashamed. He did not care if somebody walked by and said, oh, listen to that gospel music. You're a Bible thumper. Didn't care. Yet some of us care so much about what people say, we will not do certain things in church. I won't lift my hands because I'll look silly. I won't dance because I can't. Think God cares if you have rhythm or not? He's not out there with a scorecard. Seven. <laughs> this, he's, he wants your worship. Dance before him if you got no rhythm. Don't be ashamed of him. So fear man, number one. Number two, physical limitations. Some of us have physical limitations. <laughs> the older you get, the less you can do. 
It's just a fact of life. Some of you have physical issues. You might be in a wheelchair, have a cane, shoulder problems. All those things can affect how you worship. Age is an issue in worship. Maybe you're bedridden. All these things are some of the hindrances to worshiping the Lord. Now, again, this usually people make an excuse about they can't do certain things, but they're perfectly able to. It's normally those people who, who are making the excuse. It doesn't take all that, and they have you know, the ability to use their whole body with no problem. But physical issues are one of the hindrances to our worship. And then third, culture. Our culture. What I mean by that is we live in a culture where it is cool to be unaffected by things. It's cool just to stand there and be stoic and, and nothing is affecting me. This is always hilarious to me when I'm in church and I'm up here talking and a dude comes in who, who's never heard me before and he's like sitting there and he wants to laugh, but he, he doesn't want to. Because <laughs> he's in church. And you're not supposed to laugh at church. Church is not supposed to be enjoyable. So I watch him. It's always funny because they're like sitting there like... <laughs> <laughs> He wait for me. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and it's I'm trying to like contain myself because the person is like because <laughs> he just want to be stoic. You ain't funny. <laughs> it's cool to be unaffected. They tell boys, don't cry, you're a sissy. So when something's going on in church, guys, you know, we don't, we don't cry. We kind of sit back and we just say, ah, the music is cool. I'm not going to do nothing. I'm a dude. I just stand here. <laughs> That's part of our culture. And it's kind of invaded the church now. It's, if you cry in worship, then people come to you after like, hey, man, why are you crying? <laughs> You're making us look bad, dude. <laughs> Because I used to, man, because I'm not a crybaby, but like certain things affect me, and I cry, and I'm like, Lord, I can't let nobody see. So I'll be just like, oh, be talk, walking to the side, trying not to be seen, because I, I used to hate crying in front of people, because I'm, and then I'll never forget, we were doing Jonathan's um, ordination, and he was talking about his life, and all of a sudden, just broke out in tears. I mean, out of nowhere. Literally, it was just like, you know, and then I'm going to go, woo! <laughs> and I said, man, that, I said, I, that day I said, man, that was, that was hard. Like, I, to cry in front of me? Because you know I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> and he didn't care. <laughs> he cried because something affected him. He's, he wasn't like, I'm not part of this culture that just likes to be stoic and just. So it's a hindrance to worship because some people come to church and it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm just. This is how I am. I, I'm not affected by anything. We shouldn't be affected by our culture. We should not allow the culture to dictate how we worship. When you come into the, the house of God, the culture, when they say, when they start playing the music and you're supposed to be clapping and dancing, the culture said, just stand there. Jesus says, worship me, dance, jump, clap your hands. And so those are, those are some of the hindrances that we might have to worship. And again, it's more about the heart. So I want to get into specific ways that we can use our bodies to worship. Now, I'm going to have a lot of scriptures, so I have my notes for this particular part. So if, if I'm going fast, they'll be back there for you if you miss a scripture or something like that. I'm not sure how many were made, but they're back there for you. So let's go. Number one, clapping. Clapping. Clapping is an expression of delight. When something delights you, you clap, right? You ever been in a movie? At the end, people clap? That's weird, isn't it? You're like, nobody can hear you. <laughs> it's a movie. But they're delighted in what they saw. At the, when, our, when our child walks across at graduation, we clap. When our team scores a touchdown, we clap because we delight, right? We, this is delightful. And you clap. Some scriptures for you. Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Psalm 98, verse 8. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. 
Rivers clap. Mountains sing. If they clap and they sing, how much more should we? So it's an expression of delight. Now, sometimes in the Bible, it was, a, it was an expression of mockery. And there are passages that talk about the fact that sometimes the clapping was not in delight. It was in mockery. This might be the same as if, you know, if you're playing basketball, you score a point, and then you're like, come on, man, let's go, let's go. You're not happy that you scored. You're trying to show the other person up. But for us in worship, clapping is delight because we love God. Now, where might this be appropriate in our worship services? The end of a song? We just finished singing, we clap. You know, we clap you know, to keep rhythm. You know, we're supposed to clap on a two and a four, right? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Because some people be on the one and three. One, two, three, four. One, that's wrong. You ever see somebody in church trying to find it? Like, you know, I don't get it. Leave them alone. Let them worship, all right? <laughs> Are you appearing American, friends? So clapping, it's an expression of worship. It is something we do with our bodies to glorify God. So f- you're free to clap. In service, at the end of a song, you're free to clap. Number two, singing. Singing is, the, is defined as making musical sounds with your voice, usually with words set to a tune. Most of us know what singing is. We all sing. I love that the, the Bible doesn't say you have to sing well to be able to sing. It, it doesn't say, sing unto the Lord, those of you guys who can. <laughs> the rest of you, be silent before the Lord. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't say that. Sometimes I wish it did in like s- certain places, but I'm glad that it's not about your ability in singing. I love Christianity because Christianity is a singing faith. More than any other faith you see in the world, Christians sing more than any other faith. And all of us know how to sing. We all sing. We sing in the shower. We sing in, in the car. You ever walk into a store and been shopping and leave and whatever was playing on the thing, you singing it when you get outside? You sing. God just says, sing for me. A couple scriptures for you. Psalm 135, verse 3. It says, praise the Lord, for he is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. Amen. Psalm 95, verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 47, verse 6. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. He keeps saying it. Sing praises. Sing New Testament says, James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. So sing. There's nothing more encouraging to me than to be in a service like this and to hear people singing. That does something to my soul. When I sit there and I watch people, and it's because most of the time I can't really hear people singing. I can just hear what's coming out the speakers. But there are times where it stops or you guys for some reason get really loud. It always affects me to hear people singing. I've been in crowds of thousands. We went to Promise Keepers a couple years ago. 7,000 dudes singing. Ridiculous. You got to understand, in heaven, there's going to be billions of people singing praises to God. That is going to be an amazing experience. But to see and to hear people giving praise to God is it's a, it's an awesome experience. So where do we sing in service? We sing during the song. We can sing after the song. You know, sometimes we're singing after the song. We're still singing things. It may not be what's on the screen. It's just us pouring our heart out before the Lord, and it's okay to do that. Number three, shouting. Shouting to speak or call out loudly. It's an expression of joy. If you look in the Hebrew, it literally means to raise a glad cry. Um, sometimes worship should be loud. Sometimes, some, like, sometimes we should have to put in earplugs because it's so loud. I'm not even talking about the music. I'm just talking about the people. I was at a worship conference, and this guy, his name is Evan Wickham, and he goes to this church down in San Diego. And after we led, he came up to me, and he was, we were kind of talking, and he's put out some albums, really, really cool guy. And so we were talking about his church, and I said, sometimes I watch him 
online do worship and lead worship. And I said, I really enjoy your music and everything you do. And he said, he said yeah, he said, those people are the most singingest people I have, I have ever seen. They are so loud that when we're doing worship, I, he said, sometimes I can't even hear myself. That's how loud they're singing. At the end of a song, they're shouting to God so loudly that I'm like, man, I can't, I can't even hear myself sing. Sometimes worship should be loud. Sometimes we should shout. Now, what do we shout? We shout praises. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy. We honor you. And you don't just say, God, we honor you. You shout it. All this I'm shouting in my heart business. Don't say that. <laughs> I'm shouting in, in, in my innermost being. No, you, let, let's hear you shout. Sometimes, and sometimes it's not just shouting things. Sometimes it could be just shouting, period. The end of a song, yeah, God is what, that, that does something. At the end, um, Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, they're walking around. He said, when, they get, when we get around the seventh time, just shout. Why? Why were they shouting? It was a cry of victory. God, you've given us the city. You've given us these people, so we're just going to shout. That's why sometimes at the end of a song, it's good to just raise a shout. Just raise a shout. Like, you got to do it at appropriate times. <laughs> you, you, like, you can't, you're sing, singing, bow down, and where is he? That's not appropriate. But no, at the end of a song, a fast, upbeat song that was loud, it is perfectly great to shout. Because sometimes if, you, if everybody's shouting, you might be more inclined to shout. Because like, sometimes when I lead worship in a smaller group, when there's only a few of us, people don't sing. Because they're afraid they'll hear me. And so I'm always trying to encourage you guys, it's okay, sing. Nobody's going to judge you. At least I'm not. All right? So don't, don't, don't worry about that. People are very subconscious about that. But if everybody's raising up a shout, you might be more inclined to raise a shout also. Nobody wants to be like the first one screaming. But if everybody else is screaming, we'll all, I bet you we'll all join in with the praise. Because we tend to be followers. Whatever's going on, we just, oh, I'll do that too. Because we're, we're sheep. <laughs> Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 19. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So it is appropriate to shout. It is okay to make some noise in this place. Number four, bowing. Bowing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine that with kneeling. Um, I don't think they're the same thing, but I want to talk about them both at the same time. But let me just define bowing. It's an act of submission. Um, before something or someone thought to be worthy of honor, it's showing respect. And then kneeling, I would define that as a bodily posture which expresses an attitude of humility. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot for somebody to bow down. It humbles you to bow down. And this is probably one of the most unused expressions of worship I've seen in the church. People just, just don't bow down. Now, last week, was it last week? We had an experience. We sang the song, Bow Down, and there were people just here in the front, and I'm, I'm sure maybe other places, who are just bowing down before the Lord. Now, we oftentimes, we don't do that unless the song says bow down. But if the song doesn't say bow down, oftentimes we don't do it because to bow down is such a sign of humility. And you saying, God, I, I bow myself before you. I have nothing. But some people don't like to do it. They like to stand up and be told. Remember the whole thing first, our culture? I'm not affected. Okay, when they arrest you, it makes you get on your knees. Because they want you to know you are not an authority. I want you to know I have authority over you. And we don't like that. I was at a, a church, and a guy was talking about bowing and kneeling, and he said, I want all the guys in the room to kneel right now. And everything in me was like, we're here to hear, listen to a message. You want to play Simon Says. <laughs> Simon Says, kneel down. I was so, I didn't want to do it, but I did it. I knelt on the ground. And he said, how does this feel? And I felt vulnerable. I'm just, 
and I'm in a weird position. Somebody attacks me, I can't fight. I, you, you just feel vulnerable, and God, he wants us to be in that state sometimes where we are just vulnerable before him. Guys, I would love to see us some Sundays just bow down before the Lord here in this service. Now, sometimes we say, well, the chairs are there, and I can't bow down with chairs. If there was a fire in here, you would do all you could to get out. When you really want to do something, you can do it. And I think bowing is one of those things that I can say I, I've probably done on a few occasions, but it's an act of worship, and you're saying to the Lord, I submit to you, and I'm expressing to you that I want to be humble before you. Sometimes we just need to get on our knees. Now, I talk about limitations. Some of you, if you get on your knees, you won't get back up. So, so you, you can't do it. Because some, some of us, because of our physical limitations, we, we can't do it. But some of you, you are perfectly able. And you can bow down. You can lay down. You can kneel before him. And that would honor God. Look at some scriptures. Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Exodus 34, verse 8. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Nehemiah. 8.6 Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now here's some scriptures about kneeling. Um, Psalm 95, verse 6 again, we just read that. Second Chronicles 29, in verse 29. When the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. So kneeling is an acceptable way to worship God. Number six, dancing. Dancing. Now, what's weird is that dancing is something that we all do or have done at some point in our lives. Either we dance now, maybe not at church, but we dance, maybe not at church, but we, we dance at home and we dance in other places. But in a lot of people are very nervous about dancing because they say, I can't dance. You know what dancing is? It's moving rhythmically to music. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. This is dancing. That's dancing. You, can you do that? Yeah. Because yeah. people think dancing, they think, ah, I'm doing all this. <laughs> people say, let's dance before the Lord. People are like looking for a partner. <laughs> dance with me. It's like... Stop dancing. Dancing is just moving rhythmically to music. And listen, you don't have to have any rhythm to dance. You can just two-step. I've seen Jonathan get down and boy, he's just going for it. <laughs> Go, Jonathan. When I have a church, man, I'm going, I'm, if you're not there, I'm not going to have any material. <laughs> I'm going to miss you, man. <laughs> All it is is moving rhythmically to music, and you can all do that. That means when we're in church, I see, I won't point him out, but I see someone do this. <laughs> it ain't, ain't <laughs> He'd be on a drum just like going. But they do this, and I, I was so encouraged by that, because before, this person was somebody who didn't move, and now I watch them, and they just have this little, hey. And I always smile because that is that is dancing. Don't get nervous when we get to that song. Let's dance. Somebody's like, oh. <laughs> fear of man. Don't let fear of man get you. Go ahead, do whatever you got. <laughs> Don't worry about what people say. <laughs> Just let it go. Let it, just let it. It doesn't matter what it looks like because you worship before God. <laughs> Not people. <laughs> you guys are messing me up. All right. It's a spontaneous expression of joy. It's spontaneous. When you're dancing, you're not thinking about it. Right foot, left. <laughs> Twist. When you do the electric slide, do you think about it? Now, see, some people, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> but most of us, when you dance, you just, whatever comes to you, you're just, you just go. Dance like that before. That's how David danced. He just started going. We don't know what it looked like, but he just started going. And his wife was in the window like, look at this dude. He 
He's king of Israel, and you out there dancing, looking like a fool. You got people in the church. See, look at them dancing. Doesn't take all that. Just, just stand before the Lord. That's what he says. Stand before me. Which we sing the song, I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned. They didn't say I'll dance. So people have an issue with dancing. And again, people think that churches, you know, when we go out of this place, we don't dance. You do. So why not dance here? Now, there are appropriate dances. There are, you know, there's a way to dance outside of church and a way to dance in church. That's, that's a given. You're adults. You should know those things. But Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand. Right, Clemson? And all the women followed her with tambourines and what? Dancing. Dancing. It is not wrong to dance in church. Scripture tells us we can dance. 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 through 7. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet, the king, meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. Did that say lutes? Lutes. And they danced... As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Psalm 149, verse 3. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. Don't let anybody ever tell you that dancing is not in the scripture. I have a friend, he's, he's um, white and he's a pastor. and Sometimes when we're um, worshiping with them, he'll, he'll, he'll try and get his congregation to like dance. And it's they, they really, they can't. He says, we believe in dancing. He said, we do. He just says, we just can't. <laughs> and I always tell him, hey, man, you guys can. It's not about having great rhythm. It's just moving rhythmically to music, whatever you can do. And you guys can do that. So the idea that when we come into worship that dancing has to look a certain way and that when we come in here and, and we're, we're giving God praise and the people say dance, that you have to do it a certain way. No. Dance the way God has made you to dance. Number seven, the lifting of hands. A church asked their congregation this question. Do you think, and they were doing a survey and they wanted them to, to give an answer. Do you think people who lift their hands in worship should be discouraged from doing this? In a church about discouraged, so when somebody's hands raised, stop it. <laughs> Don't do that. Five said yes. 152 said no. So lurking in the church were five people who that if your hands were raised, they would have called the usher. Shh, get him. His hands are raised. People actually think that raising your hands is a distraction. Lifting up the hands is adoration to God. It's praise to God. Listen to Psalm 141, verse 2. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening, evening sacrifice. Psalm 63, verse 4. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name... I will lift up my hands. It's a sign of adoration. I think another way we can reason why we would lift our hands is sometimes in the scriptures, the raising of a hand would be the swearing of an oath. You're making a promise to someone, to God, I'm going to follow through with my promise to do whatever it was. And I think sometimes in worship, when we're raising our hands, one of the things we are saying is, God, I'm promising to do some things. I was trying to figure out there are certain songs that it, when I get to a certain point, it's almost like I can't keep my hand down. It just flies up. And I was trying to figure out why is that? And a lot of times I noticed it was when there was something being sung or something being said that I wanted to do. And I want to promise the Lord I'm going to do that. I want to be like Jesus. God, I'm promising I want to be like Jesus. When I walk out of here, I want to be like Jesus. Listen to Genesis 14. Verse 22 and 23. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread 
or the thong of a sandal so that you never will be able to say, I made Abram rich. And again, raising of your hands, God, I'm promising not to do some things. Sign of adoration could be a sign of, of making a promise or an oath. Could also be a sign of victory. When somebody scores a touchdown, we raise our hand. Yeah! Because it's victory. It could be a sign of surrender. Put your hands in the air. Now somebody who, who's being told to put your hands in the air and you don't do it, what does it mean? You don't surrender. You're about to get tased or you're about to get shot. Because it's a sign of surrender. You're saying to the person who told you something to do, all right. And sometimes when we sing the song, I surrender all, and I see people's hands up, I'm wondering, are they really surrendering all? Because with their body, they're saying, yes, I do surrender all. But maybe in their heart, they're not. You see this at sports events. You ever notice when somebody scores a touchdown, I don't know if you've ever seen it from like outside and seen the whole arena. Everybody's hands goes up. Like People don't go, yay! That'd be weird. But when people are happy, hands go up. Sign of victory. Sign of surrender. Those of you guys who have kids, when your kids want you to pick them up, what do they do? Daddy, mommy. Sometimes it's God, I just want to be in your arms. God, I just, I just want you to hold me. I just want to be near to you. And sometimes, I, I, I want to say this, I watch people, and I'm saying this in love and encouraging you, learn that God loves it when you lift your hands to him and say, Daddy. Because I watch some people and I'm like, they're having such a difficult time lifting your hands. Now, some, of, some other people, you have no problem. We're not even in the song yet. Your hands are already up. But some of you guys struggle. And let me just tell you in love. You, some people say, well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm very reserved. I'm very conservative. And I've never met the person who is, who is consistent across the board with that. In other words, you can get mad. Something can make you not be a reserved person anymore. You know, I'm in church. I'm very, very quiet. Let somebody rear end you. Let somebody key your car. Let somebody just slap you. Now, I, I don't know if anybody in this room, I could be wrong, but I don't know if anybody in this room, somebody walked up to you and just, whoop And you're just like, I'm very reserved. That wasn't nice. <laughs> I just want to tell you, that was, not, that was not cool. And they punch you in the face. Oh, that wasn't cool. That wasn't nice. That, that's not, that's not. Nobody's like that. Yet when we come into worship, we want to do this, I'm reserved. I'm quiet. You're not reserved. You're not quiet in every aspect of your life. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> so lift your hands to the Lord. Let me just encourage you to do it because, listen, most people are not going to care if you have your hands raised. In fact, most people in this room are going to be encouraged by it. I can tell you, I watch from up here. My heart is to see you worship. The heart of the people who lead worship is to see you worship. To use your body. We're not up here. We don't, in our meetings, we don't go, okay. Um, Atien was not lifting his hands. <laughs> Rochelle was not lifting her hands. <laughs> Sent her an email. We don't do that. <laughs> we, we don't do it. We don't have a, a meeting about who's worshiping and who's not. But we do talk about the fact we want, we want to bring them into a place where they feel comfortable lifting their hands before the Lord. And even if they're not comfortable, to say, I'm going to do it anyway because it's commanded of me. And sometimes just by doing it, it will free you up. The first time you do it, you're just like, okay, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. And then you'll just be like, it's not so bad. This is not so bad. It's like the, the kid who's freaking out because of the pool because they're scared. And then you throw them in there for the first time. And they're like, ah, 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 hey. <laughs> and they're fine. Jump into the pool of worship and just say, you know what? If I drown, I drown. But at least I'm going to try. I was, I was encouraged this morning. 
that I saw, I mean, hands were just all over the place. I just saw, I was like, woo, that's, I mean, I'm going to talk about this too. It's, the last two weeks has been weird. What I'm going to talk about ends up happening in worship. But lift your hands before God. It's a sign of victory, a sign of surrender, adoration, surrendering the oath. And in, in um, conclusion, I want to talk about consideration because one of the things that happens in churches is that we come into church and we want to um, get our praise on. I'm coming into church to get my, and there is no consideration of who's around you. When we come into worship, our first, for, our first order of business is to edify one another. That means if what you're doing is causing an issue, like for example, if you're just worshiping God, I just worship God like this. That's how I worship. Now that's fine if you're by yourself. But the fact that we are this close to one another, you can't do that. Okay? You can't, none of this. Because people are, st- people are standing next to you. Now if you want to do that and you want to get out in the aisle, that's fine. But consideration, thinking about, I don't want what I'm doing to distract from people's eyes being on Jesus. Because some people with their actions, you think more about what they're doing. I've been to churches where the person, like, it's not, it's over now. All that's going on is over, and the person is like on the side, and they're screaming at the top of their lungs. And I'm thinking, okay, I know they have control of themselves. If they're really feeling the Lord like this, they can walk outside. But now, we're trying to listen to the word, and this person's still over there screaming. I've seen my dad say, ushers, get them out of here. Because that person is not thinking about other people. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. That means even in your worship, you're thinking about who's around you. Not in the, the way of, what if they're watching me? And here's the thing, there needs to be a balance because some people will say, it doesn't take all that, stop doing all that, so knock it off. And those people need to understand there is expression in worship. But some of us were very, very expressive, and sometimes we need to understand, we need to think about others. Because Paul says you have to consider other people. We should not be a church where it seems chaotic and there is no order. I was reading a thing this week and they were talking about what does decency and in order mean? Because a lot of times that is defined by our culture. Because when we have church, we say, okay, this and then this and then this and then benediction, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that's decency and in order. That's just the way we do it. So in the Bible, it might have been decent and in order for somebody to, for an hour, scream and run around the church. Because that was in the context of what was going on. So when we think about decency and in order, don't think it means we're not expressive. It doesn't mean we don't dance. It doesn't mean that we don't shout. It doesn't, all those things we do. But we do it with this idea. We're worshiping God and we're thinking about others. So never come to church and say, I'm going to get my praise on. I don't care who's around me. You should care who's around you. And if you think you're going to do something that's going to cause a distraction, I've seen many people who've kind of gone to a, por- a part of the church as to not draw attention to themselves. Wisdom. Because they're saying, I don't want people watching me when they should be watching Christ. And I'll just say this, because I can, and I have the mic. <laughs> that There are certain people in our church, and I'm, I don't want to say their names, but I'm not going to, that encourage me by the way that they worship physically because they, they don't care and they will worship right across here <laughs> all the way back right here hey it's almost like we have a mascot <laughs> whatever <laughs> all you guys I know who it is I know who it is I know who you're talking about <laughs> but it's it's encouraging because I've seen people get freed up like yeah I could do that because some people think that our church is crazy you go there they walk around 
I'm a soldier, and they walk around the church. That's so weird. But then you have other churches that will say, we're, we're, we're too reserved. We don't have service for five hours. We're reserved. We don't do shout music. We're reserved. Worship is not about doing what other churches do. It's doing what we want to do before the Lord. Being yourself. However you dance, that's how you dance. However you lift your hands. Some of you, when you lift your hands, you have them like this. Some of you, when you have your hands like this, locked elbow, <laughs> your hands at this angle or this angle, you lift your hands different. With me, when I lift my hands, I have my three fingers out like this, and I just have it like this, like a, like a claw. <laughs> That's how I worship. Some of you worship like this. Some of you, when you bow, you're like this. We don't have to all do it the same way. <laughs> hey, put your hand up a little bit higher. <laughs> You don't have to do that. Worship the way God created you to worship with your body. Now, I'm not saying next week, you know, we have a fiasco in here. It's like (laughs) people on the ground, people jumping, shouting. and stuff. But it's being in context and knowing what's going on and letting the spirit lead you. And I think people will be attracted to that. I've gone. People have come to our church because they've heard of us. I've heard of your worship. I've heard the way you guys do things. I want to go and see that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So let's pray.